Hello, everybody. Happy Sunday. We're going to be talking about some things that I read over the last week that has me a, a little nervous on what may happen with, uh, uh, hold on here. Eddie, you got your mic on. Oh, sorry about that. We had double, we had double, uh, audio there for a hot second. So sorry about that. Eddie, we still have double audio. That's what I'm so sorry. Do you have the uh, other computer going in the other uh, room? I'm so, good Lord, that is obnoxious. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Oh, you guys can hear me okay, but there's no double audio? Okay. Maybe it's just my speakers. Can you hear me now? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it was it must have happened with my speakers. Anyways, so back to the paper. A couple of weeks ago, um, I, I saw some like rumblings from some experts that were talking about how ridiculous the 30 year mortgage is. And then this guy comes out and starts talking about how home prices would not be anywhere near where they're at if we didn't have FHA mortgages and uh, 30 year mortgages. I'm gonna get into why I think this is just completely terrible that he's saying this. because. What he's really saying is that they don't want poor people to buy houses. So that's a basically where, uh, to me, that's what it says to me. But you give your own opinion. All right. It's an article that came out. You guys know who Peter Schiff is. He's the, he is the actual person who said we were in big trouble in 2008. He was the one that said, stop doing this. And he, he's the, he is the godfather. I know there's a lot of people who say that I was the oracle of the last housing crash and they gave themselves all these names. But this dude is the dude that actually was the real dude. Okay, so um, Yahoo Finance puts us off from another company. That's what they do because everything's behind a paywall. So if the government was completely out of the housing market, prices would be lower, Peter Schiff says. The real estate is in a massive bubble because of guaranteed mortgages. So I don't know if you know this, but in other countries, you don't get a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. You get a, uh, like, you have to, like, negotiate your mortgages every so often, so many years. You only get a period of time. You don't get them for, you know, a fixed rate for 30 years. All right, Eddie, if you could scroll down on that article, I'd greatly appreciate it. Ooh, we'll see what happens. Now the audio's wonky. Oh no, let me see if it's something on my end. Do do do. Audio. Audio. Uh uh. Eddie uh, do, do, do do. All right, maybe I need to uh, like speak into the camera. Like I'm, I'm gonna move this so you can hear me better. All right, you guys hear me okay now? Um, hmm. All right. How was that? It's better. Okay. Man, I hate it. I hate that this has happened. All right. Um, Euro Pacific is asset manager, CEO, and global strategist. Peter Schiff is well known for his predictions of the seismic global financial events in a podcast with Sachs uh, Realty. Founder Todd Sachs, Schiff spoke out on the impact of our governmental policies that artificially inflated real estate prices. He referred to his past interviews as a legacy of new channels where he spoke on about the consequences of keeping interest rates too low for too long and moral hazards inherent with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And this is when he gets into the 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Uh, here's the thing like, he doesn't say 38. He doesn't say the 30 year fixed rate mortgage, but you know, we can go between the lines. He's talking about these guaranteed loans. 
that's what they, they want that gone. We didn't always have 30 year loans, by the way. Uh, uh, the real estate market is highly inflated with an uh, inflated bubble economy, according to the financial commoner. Federal Reserve policies have artificially suppressed how, uh, the cost of financing homes with low interest rates. And this policy is subsidizing the massive property bubble. Policies encouraging the Fed to buy back government bonds and mortgage-backed securities also helped inflate the real estate prices. Government-backed agencies like uh, FHA, Freddie Mac, and Fannie Mae, with their guaranteed mortgages, are assured lenders against Eddie's girl. Um, government uh, and agencies like Freddie Mac, guaranteed mortgages, assured lenders against default risk. This also resulted in mil uh, mitigating borrowers' credit to some extent and qual qualifying them for a much lower interest rate on their mortgages. Home buyers would qualify for larger loan and otherwise be a case in a free market. Oh, the audio is still bad, huh? Good lord, I don't know what is going on. You know what? Hold on, I'm gonna switch. I'm gonna switch computers. Be right back. Let's let's. Um, I'm gonna be right back. Eddie, can can you hold the stage for a second? I'm gonna put Eddie on the stage. I'm gonna go to his computer. And I'll be right back. <laughs> you can look at Eddie for a second. Sorry, everyone. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We will make sure we get this taken care of. Hello, everyone. I know I normally don't get seen, and that's that's perfectly fine. That's how I want it. <laughs> um, hold on one second. All right. So, um, we. I'm uh I'm just gonna play the doo -doo -doo music for you. Um, give me one second. Hello, lovely Ben Holmes. Hello, Lee T H the the the. <laughs> uh, since Christina is gone, we can do trivia. No, we cannot lawnmower, and that tells you how long lawn's been around. Cause uh, we used to do Thursday night trivia, and that is long gone. <laughs> um, yes. Debbie Brady, I would rather be behind the scenes um, and not uh, in front of the camera. <laughs> and he sounds great and looks well. Well, thank you very much. Um, as, as you guys probably can see, the old studio, um, you guys can probably see that. Uh, no lovely Ben Holmes, no trivia. No, no, no. <laughs> June, hello. June 12th, thank you very much. Uh, I know my, my mic works. Uh, so does my camera. <laughs> Johnny Johnson, thank you. It is a pleasure to see you guys um, on this Sunday, and I apologize for the um, the technical difficulties. Uh, Christina did warn me this, and I was actually cleaning cat litter beforehand, so I do apologize, um, and I was running the last minute, or else I would have told her her audio was horrible. Uh, what am I, what are my predictions for the housing market? Uh, so Jeff Underwood, my predictions, not real estate predictions and not anybody else. Uh, but from looking at everything that we've seen, uh, I believe we're going to be kind of stagnant with, a, it might hit a little bit lower, but again, uh, that doesn't mean that in the summertime, this is going to jump up again. Oh, look who it is. <laughs> can we hear you? <laughs> I, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and it sound good. Uh, you know, I think we had, we had a really racket, I mean, terrible storm last night. So I'm thinking that maybe that's what caused it. So, um, yeah, the, the, uh, the, uh, background and everything may not be so cute. <laughs> so, and hopefully that spinning fan won't get in the way. To get the home much. background. <laughs> We're All inside right. the house now. Thank God it's clean. We just cleaned it today. <laughs> Thank God. I'm going to take myself out and give it back to you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. That's my whole computer thing. All right. So let's get into this article. So the thing is, is that this guy, Peter Schiff, who has, um, Schiff has predicted many, many housing markets in the past. The last one, he was dead on on what was supposed to be happening. What he's saying is that because we have guaranteed mortgages and we've had, uh, guaranteed, um, uh, fixed rates for so long that people are now like basically changing their house. There's no way they're going to end up selling. And he said that this all kind of like was a catalyst because of these 30 year fixed rate mortgages. And so 
I mean, if he if he was to have it his way, he didn't say this. I'm not quoting him, but it, the way it reads to me, this article that come it's for on Yahoo News, and you can turn that light off. It's actually worse. Thank you. Um, uh, it's actually like the the worst thing you could do because what happens is that what gets most people into a home today is a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Uh, you know, we have these FHA programs to encourage people to buy the houses and to imply that this is the way to fix the housing problem today is a really stupid idea because anytime the, uh, the housing has gone to crap, the only thing that has saved it every single time is first time home buyers and who really benefits from those FHA mortgages. That would be your first time home buyers. And those incentives that uh, with those low down payments, with those mortgage plans, even though they, that this guy, the expert is saying, this has got us into this situation. I don't think it be, should be something that we are penalizing future generations from getting into a house. To me, this just seems to be another layer of trying to get younger generations to never own real estate. In my opinion, this is only my opinion. And uh, they, the more they, they, uh, they always try to make it our fault on on a lot of these things. So it's like, oh, it's your fault because all these people decided to take a thirty year mortgage instead of doing a fifteen year mortgage, and that's why home prices are so high. And you know, it's oh, it's the public's fault because everybody took those low interest loans, and now everybody's locked into those rates. And forty two percent of Americans don't even have mortgages, and that's why home prices are so high. And you know, it's it's always our fault. You know, it's never the people that create the problems in the first place. It's the public's problem. And uh, to me, to me, it's just another layer of trying to get younger generations to not be able to purchase a home. That's why they keep making these build to rent houses. That's why they have all these corporate investors that are buying homes. They never stop buying homes, no matter what you have read in, the, in magazines or like, oh, corporations are pulling back from buying houses. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. They may have paused for a hot minute, but they never like stopped. They never fully stopped and they're never going to stop because they know that real estate is making them a lot of money. And they make a lot, even a lot of money on the smaller the houses are. The more affordable the houses are, the less likely they're, you know, the less they just have. They know that though that because they have inflated the home prices so incredibly high, and the houses are small, that they can get those people in there to rent because there's nowhere else for them to go. So that's how I look at it. <laughs> that's how I'm even looking at it. So. Uh, Oh, you know what? Somebody just put this on here. Hi there from Tennessee. Uh, somebody like, uh, this is a really good uh, comment. Uh, Alfie Singer said that uh, Dave Ramsey ripped into a girl who took a loan from her 401k for a down payment. Okay. So when I, in 2000, what was it? When would the pandemic start? 2020. Was it 20? Yeah, it was 2020. During 2020, I was showing this girl this house and um, the house didn't even appraise for the amount that she offered, which blew my mind. I'm like, you're not going to pay this. Are you? She's like, well, I'm going to have to. And then she was trying to get it from her parents and her parents were like, well, we, we can't help you with this. And, and the only way she could have done it is if she took out the money from her 401k. And I was like, Mm -mm 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 -mm. I was uh, like Dave Ramsey on this one, right? Like, this is a really bad idea. Who knows if these home prices are going to hold? Sure enough. Sure enough. Like she bought this house for $20,000 over the asking, uh, the appraised value, $20,000 over the appraised value. She borrows it for a moment for 401k. Nine months later, she's, uh, it's a wash. I mean, I, hopefully she put it back in, I hope she refinanced and put it back in our account, but most likely she didn't. But if we're, she was smart, she did that <laughs> because man, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm always kind of curious to figure out what's going to to make the housing, uh, bubble pop. Um, are they going to, is it going to be the fact that they get away from 30 year fixed rate mortgages? So they don't have enough people buying homes. Is it going to be, um, is it going to be the build to rent? So because they build so many of these, uh, first time home buyers for people to, uh, rent first time home buying homes for people to rent. And, and then it becomes a thing of the past where people purchase. Is it going to be um, a big collapse of the uh, jobs market and that causes people to be foreclosed on? 
Um, is it going to be a wave of um, uh, transfer of wealth? You know, I, I'm I'm just curious. What what is it that you think? What do you think it's going to be the catalyst to make home prices come down? Because obviously it's not sustainable. When the average American home in the United States is over $400,000 and the average income in the America has not has not changed and our cost of living has increased so incredibly high, like what what's it what's it going to be? What's going to cause this to happen? Because you and I know this is not sustainable. What is it going to do to make it pop? What is it going to make home prices? In your opinion, just is just this is just conjecture. This is what you feel in your gut. Uh, I really want to know. Living in Omaha, Dave uh, Matney says, "What is the biggest challenge being married to Christina? <laughs> what is the biggest challenge being married to Christina?" Oh, I think it's my multiple personality disorder. I mean, I don't really have that, but I, I definitely get them. Uh, I mean, there's m many days I can't even stand myself. <laughs> it's like, I've even told my husband, like, when I used to work really late, I go, and he go, what is wrong with you? I'm like, I don't even know. I just need to put myself to bed. I am so incredibly obnoxious. <laughs> so, anyways, John Barnhart says, question. There's a builder in a subdivision in uh, Sanford, North Carolina that is offering 3.9% on a 30 year mortgage. Uh, quiet the builder incentive. Don't you? Oh, quite the builder incentive. Don't you think? P.S. My wife said Eddie is pretty hot. He is hot. <laughs> like I used to always say, I'm like, my, I have a good looking husband. That's, that would, let me introduce you to my good looking husband. And he's like, stop it. Stop. He always, you know, self-deprecating. That's what we do. Um, so what the home builders are offering, uh, awesome incentives right now. Um, they're ready to get some of their inventory off the book, especially if you're in an area that has a lot of new construction. They're offering buy downs on your uh, mortgage, but make sure that it's, is it that buy down? Is it 3.9% for X amount of years? And then it goes up to the interest rate then, or, you know, like, what is it? I know it says 3.9, but is it 3.9 for 30 years? Or is it 3.9 for five years? Or, you know, like find out what it is that the terms are for the, those um, those incentives. A lot of uh, other home builders are offering a lot of closing costs and they're offering a lot of upgrades right now. Um, in my area, they're like offering over $10,000 in upgrades, like a flooring, cabinetry, um, garage uh, extensions on your garage, all sorts of stuff to get people in because they want to sell them before the end of the year. It's kind of like, you know, just like car sales or, or refrigerator sales or anything else, you know, at the end of the year, they're trying to wipe out their inventory. So it's a good time to look at new construction. Don't don't even if you think that you can't afford it because you're like, oh, my gosh, I can't afford a four hundred thousand dollar house. But with those interest rates, you might be able to just just look at it that way. Questions on your thoughts on construction loans instead of a standard mortgage or a personal loan to build your own house. Well, I. Here in Louisiana, if you have the piece of land and you're wanting to roll in um, your construction costs, I that's it's a construction loan. You can't you can't build a home with a traditional standard mortgage if it's not you can't get a traditional standard mortgage on a home that's not constructed because it it's meant for a structure that already exists. Um, I'm not a big loan person, but I do know that. So no matter what, you're still going to have to get some kind of construction loan in order to start that process of uh, building your house, unless you have cash and, and then you can start it on your own with your own money. But um, if it was me, I would, I would borrow before I just spend my own cash. I always like having cash on hand because you never know what's going to happen. Um, JSK Anderson says, Justin, Congress has two bills to stop corporations from buying houses. That was my next, that was my next one. <laughs> That was my next article. You you took it from me. <laughs> Here it is. New Senate bill, Senate bill aims to curb corporate investors from buying up single family homes. To me, this is the biggest, uh, just like, it was so obvious this was happening years ago, but it was so under the radar because we were all so busy with our own entire, with our lives. I even was talking about this with Jeremy Knight back in 2019 because corporations around austin texas which is, i mean now we know why but corporations were buying a bunch of houses around smaller homes all around austin texas and i said wow this was like on page three in google some random magazine i'm like this is this is alarming 
well, uh, come to find out now, you know, now we all know. And still they try to say, well, we, we only bought 2% of the market. Yeah. If you took the whole entire nine United States and say, oh, we only did 2%, but they're not saying it's in a concentrated area all across the Sun Belt, and they're buying up a lot. And I think, and it, we all know it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than 2%. Anyways, to stop the Stop Predatory Investing Act, we all know it's predatory, introduced a tu uh, Tuesday by a coalition of lawmakers, including Senator, oh, who cares about who they are, aims to limit the corporate investors from purchasing homes by restricting their tax breaks. The bill is stop investors from who buy 50 or more single family homes after the date of the law's enactment uh, from deducting interest or depreciating uh, on those properties. Can we just stop right there? You know that any investor that's buying more than 50 properties at the 49th property, they're going to go ahead and make another company, another LLC and say, okay, well, I was ABCD company. Now I'm going to be ABCD one company and they're going to buy more houses, you know, and they'll make different, uh, oh, you know, they're, they'll, they'll get around this. Anyways, it says too many uh, communities in Ohio with big investors funded by Wall Street buying up homes that could have gone to first time home buyers, then jacking up the rent, neglecting repairs and threatening families with eviction. All the things I said that would happen with these companies. Our bill will help prevent corporate landlords from driving up local ho housing prices and put power back in the hands of working families who need a safe, affordable place to live with and raise their children. I mean, that, that isn't too much to ask. Um, but, you know, their corporate investors are sneaky, man. Like if they have enough buy, um, buying power to buy 50 homes, don't you think they have the smarts and buying power to create another company and another family member's name or some random person's name that they can go ahead and buy another 50 homes? I mean, uh, I, I, it, it's a step in the right direction. And if it does go to the floor, and it does get voted on. I'm extremely interested on who doesn't vote on it. Either they just refuse to vote or they um, they uh, vote against it. I'm interested to see. I want to see the whole entire language of what will happen with this. I have to get my tea. You know how I am with my tea. So <laughs> I'm grabbing my tea. <laughs> do, do, do. You guys are going to take a walk in my house. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it's a step in the right direction. I'm just like, the thing is, is you all know, uh, politicians are, are paid by corporations. And the ones who probably put this bill together are not the ones that are being paid by corporations, but they're a good portion of them are. So, <laughs> Eddie's like, yep, they are. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see who, who actually votes for this. Because it's, I mean, it's all it is, is meant to help the public. And everything that's been voted on in the last, I don't know, seven years hasn't really done much to help us. I mean, it's ridiculous. Clark the Realtor says, um, that's like talking, uh, that's, let, let, let's try this again. That's like these people taking HELOCs out for 18 to 19%. Isn't it just crazy? Okay. So, <sighs> Yes, HELOCs are crazy, but they're not, they're crazy good and crazy bad. Anytime I think every person that has a mortgage that has a equity on it should have a HELOC. That does not mean you have to use your HELOC. It just means that you have it in place for anything that could come up that you would need to have a large sum of money quickly. Who knows? Let's just put it, we'll give you an example why you uh, would, it would be a good idea for you to have a HELOC. You have a big giant storm that comes through your house. You have a HELOC on your home and you have a company that's coming through that can put up tarps and everything else. You don't have any extra cash laying around, but you do have all the checks that you need for your HELOC. You can go ahead before your insurance company gives you your payout for the, your insurance. You can go ahead and use that HELOC to go ahead and pay those people ahead of time to get some of your stuff done and, and fixed, at, you know, at least until you get that insurance check. Um, there's multiple ways that you can use a HELOC. You just have to be responsible with it. It's just like owning a credit card, but at least it's your money that you can borrow against. I, I always say, and if you have a mortgage that has equity on it, go ahead and set, set yourself up with a HELOC. Mm. 
Somebody asked what a HELOC is. It's a home equity line of credit. It's that's the acronym is HELOC home equity line of credit. Um, Seco Sound says, hello from Central Maine. I've been uh, watching you for about six months now. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad you've been around. Sorry for the, uh, the, the uh, atmosphere has changed today <laughs> because something went on with my computer. We had a nasty storm and it messed with my settings. So I don't know what, what was going on in there. No one could hear me. Um, I'll, I will mess with it when we get done here. Um, <laughs> we were supposed to be. I would have set up for this stream a lot sooner, but my husband and I got at a cleaning spree, <laughs> totally off the subject of uh, HELOCs or anything else. But we got this great trick, and it's where you take um, I don't I, I don't know how if you like cleaning blinds, but my husband and I can't stand it. And you know how you have to take down all the blinds and you have to spray them, and it's just it takes too long. So we found this trick where you take uh, those little clampy. Um, I don't know what those called those little tongs that you use for cooking and you wrap them with two rags and dip them in soapy water and clean each one of them. So we were going around cleaning all of our uh, blinds. We got, we got overzealous. <laughs> we started going crazy cleaning blinds, and all of a sudden I'm like, Eddie, we got to get ready for this stream. <laughs> so, anyways, that's why we didn't know it was uh, our audio was off. Normally we would have checked it. Not only that, I didn't even have the air conditioning on in that room and it was hot, 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 hot. So it was just meant for us to be here. Oh, look, you guys can get a look at my Christmas tree. There it is. Hi, Christmas tree. <laughs> All right. Question. What, um, what did the prices, uh, why did prices went up to 40% in the past two years? Is it because of the excess money printing and will they go back to as extra money uh, is already spent? Okay. There's multiple reasons why home prices went up the way they did. A lot of at the beginning, and I and I know this because I was selling houses at that time uh, with to a lot of buyers, and they were kind of at the point of like, well, you know, uh, we were we were, we were going to wait on getting a dream home, but if we're all going to die, we might as well die in the house that we've always wanted. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, I know that sounds crazy now, but at the time people were like genuinely scared of what, what, would, what this could possibly mean for all of us. And then more people felt like, oh my gosh, I can move anywhere because my employer is telling me I can work from work from home. So I can literally have a house wherever I want. So a lot of people packed up from the cities and started moving out to more rural locations because they could move wherever they wanted to. Um, and it, it was more appealing to do that too, with interest rates being so incredibly low. And what the first article we looked at, Peter Schiff was saying, was that Schiff was saying is that because that they kept the interest rates so incredibly low for such a long period of time during the pandemic that it caused a, a, a irrational amount of frenzy for people to purchase homes. I mean, just ridiculous. There were so many people that were just, just going crazy to buy a house because the money was cheap. You, if, it's unheard of to have a mortgage in the twos. So people that would have normally waited now were able to afford a house and have an interest rate so incredibly low. The difference is from 2008, the people that qualified for home loans during that time did not are not the same kind of home buyers that were buying homes back in 2008. The restrictions for lending today and have been for the last at least seven years have gotten stricter and stricter and stricter. I mean, like you literally have to cut off an arm during this whole entire process when you're trying to get approved for a home loan. I mean, at the last minute, they're asking for stuff like 10 minutes before you close they're asking for more um, verifications and identifications. And, and it's just it's crazy. Right. We didn't have that back in 2008. The, the people, like people keep thinking that they were going to have this big collapse because of people overspending on a house, but the people that were affording houses now are not the same kind of borrowers that we have today. So that's, that's the reason why, um, home prices continue to go up is because, uh, you know, the, the interest rates were so low, they had a buying frenzy and there was a lack of supply and with the lack of supply that always causes home prices to go up. Oh, 
with a hundred dollars super chat. Thank you so much. I hope you're having a great weekend. Thank you so much for popping in and giving us a hundred dollars super chat and supporting the stream. I always appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Johnny. <laughs> He's the best. Uh, I have to lean down to get my, my tea since I'm not in my office. <laughs> Ah, oh, that tastes good. Mm. <laughs> Shell Rock 21 says, uh, you say uh, what will make the bubble pop? It's popping now. It's almost no demand amongst the middle class for houses. Hardly any sales in the industry. You really think, uh, do you, re you really don't think it's popping? Um, I don't know where you live. And, and let, let's just be, let's just be realistic everybody's housing market in their location is going to be completely different from somebody else's. And it's so localized that like I'm in Baton Rouge, the Baton Rouge housing market is completely different than the Lafayette housing market, than the New Orleans housing market. It's always going to be regional, right? So if you're in like somewhere in Austin, Texas, where they are seeing more dramatic home sales drops, then yes, you feel like the home prices are dropping and it's popping, right? It's popping, like the whole thing's collapsing in your opinion, because that's what you see. But if you live in somewhere like Miami, New Jersey, in a Tampa, like those areas, you're not seeing significant high price drops at all, especially on the most affordable homes in your area. You're still seeing in some areas, you're still seeing uh, like you're having to fight. You're having bidding wars for these houses still. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, I just saw it. It's all falling apart. I was just in Austin, Texas. I mean, they're giving no houses away. Real estate is localized. I'm just using real estate as a, as a whole, the whole entire nation. When I'm talking about real estate, it, and as a whole right now, we are not collapsing. It is not popping as a nation in some areas. It could feel like it is in some areas. It could feel like we're still like we were in 2020, 2021, 2022. It's, it's going to be a matter of perspective for your specific area. That's why it's important to not just listen to me, listen to real estate agents in your specific market, because they're going to be the ones that have the best pulse of what's going on in your specific market. Because well, I mean, we don't have significant price changes here. We, we're flat. I mean, they're not going anywhere. It's no, more negotiable, but I mean, the home prices haven't dropped. They have not uh, significantly dropped at all. They've remained flat as, as home prices, I mean, as home interest rates have uh, gone up, they just stayed flat. Nothing was selling because home buyers are like, I'm not going to pay that amount of money for a house. Home sellers are like, I don't really need to sell. I have a 2.3% interest rate. And then the ones that did need to sell are like, well, we'll just sit here until somebody purchases it. Unless it was under that medium price home. Those houses that are the, the little three bedroom, two bath houses, those still sell like hotcakes still. Um, has anyone heard about the white house giving away 500,000 homes in the U S uh, or is that a rumor? Biden wants to give away 500,000 homes to Americans buy, uh, money buy to buy homes. Biden wants to give 500,000 Americans money to buy homes. 500,000. That's what I said. 500,000. I know. As you say, no, he wants to give 500,000 Americans money, not $500,000. I'm listening to Eddie. Eddie's arguing with me in the background. <laughs> the Biden administration said on Thursday that it was looking to help hundreds of thousands of households to realize their dream of home ownership as a part of an effort to reduce housing costs, increase supply of affordable homes, and mitigate the rising expenses of paying for a house in America for Americans. Man, what could go wrong when the when the government gets involved? That just, <laughs> through its backing of the proposal of the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, it would promote home ownership for an additional five hundred thousand households while increasing neighborhood revitalization investments. Uh. Uh, the act will introduce new federal tax credit to help fund the development of renovation of one to four family households, distressed urban, suburban, and rural neighborhoods, according to the draft of the bill. I don't, uh, 
Legislation introduced by the Senators Ben uh, Cardin, a Democrat from Maryland, and Tong Young, a Republican from Indiana, uh, could help 500,000 homes generate one. Is that 125 billion or is that 1.25 billion? No, it's 125 billion in development revenue over the next decade. The lawmakers said in the, earlier this year. But how is it, if they're giving money? How is it they're going to increase? Mm, this doesn't make sense. The housing market is in the midst of a convuls uh, convulsion of fueled by the ha Federal Reserve's effort to fight record inflation. The Fed's rising rates in the most rapid clip since the 80s has helped push borrowing costs for home buyers. Mortgage rates have soared to two decade highs and prices have jumped and the whole housing supply has fallen. By the way, uh, just on a side note, mortgage rates are like at like 7.2 right now. Um Joe Biden doesn't want to wait for Congress. The administration, for example, said that the advocating for zoning and reform reforms that will unlock construction of affordable homes. Okay, if they're going to build houses, that's fine. I don't want them to just give people money to buy a house. Our Department of Transportation will be making billions of dollars in low-cost loans available for development uh, housing near transportation. Okay, so they're going to give this to developers to build more affordable housing. All right, now I'm, 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 I'm liking this better. The administration has been trying to help first-time home buyers with their struggling gain to put a foothold in home ownership. Housing prices were nearly six times the median first-time potential first-time home buyer's income in the third quarter, according to NerdWallet's recent analysis. That is true. That is true. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with that because there's been all sorts of affordable housing initiatives that were going to work with local governments, but then the local governments would have had to take the money from um, the government in order to start some of these initiatives. It all sounded good. I mean, it was like um, to build like... Um, uh, like fix the roads, uh, deal with the crumbling bridges, but your, but your state had to want, like take the money, you know? So, um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see if the money is, if they're not just giving people money to buy a house, because if you do that, that's a recipe for disaster. If you just give people money to buy a house, that is not a good idea. And that, and it's just, to me, in my opinion, in my opinion, it's not a good idea. But if they're if they're going to build more homes with that money, that makes t entirely more sense. Um, uh, why is uh, why is housing considered a commodity? Oh, because okay. you live in the United States of America, and everything is worth money. <laughs> everything is a cost. <laughs> they figured out how to bottle water, and we bought it. Everything's a commodity. I, I mean, I, I don't like it. I think housing, to me, it's so weird to me that housing to, is turned into something that, I, as I see it now, that only the wealthy can afford. And that, to me, is gross. Like housing, everybody should be able to have an affordable place to live. Every single person that has walked on the soil of the United States of America has the right, should have the right to find an affordable place to live. If you're working here, you should be able to find an affordable place to live. For some reason, that is not the case. And and it's turned into, it never used to be like this, but now it is. It's a uh, way for Wall Street to make more money. And it's, uh, and I think that is the biggest disaster out of all of this. It's not the 30 year mortgage. It's to me, in my opinion, it's Wall Street. Wall Street has ruined housing, you know? Uh, uh, Warren Buffett wouldn't have gotten into housing and building manufactured housing and created all these loan companies and real estate companies if it wasn't a uh, cash cow for him. That's, I mean, let's be realistic. Mr. Thomas says, what do you think about the mortgage? Uh, ba uh, what do you think about mortgage take back? Uh, example, so a seller offers to hold a mortgage to hallow the new buyers to basically pay rent until the seller refines later and then closes the buyer. So, oh, you mean like a buyback? Like they, they do that. They've done that here. Um, sometimes it takes a, a little bit time for like a, a buyer, for instance, to get full loan approval. So they'll buy back uh, six months from the seller um, or, or they closed on it, but they're basically renting it 
the sellers didn't need to stay in the house for six more months. So they'll close the buyer goes ahead and rents that house to the seller for six more months. I mean, those, it's just something that happens. Um, it's, it's, it should be looked at as a case by case situation. Um, you know, if you're having, if you're having an icky feeling about the whole thing, and then the, at the end, they're like, Hey, can we do this? Trust your gut. Don't do it. But if it's something that like you guys could work out together and it, and it works out for the benefit of the both of you, then, then do it. You know, uh, it's definitely a case by case situation. Though. <laughs> there's some that like, there's some closings that I've been to that we've had to go into separate rooms because, uh, <laughs> None of us were getting along. <laughs> None of us. And it wasn't like, I don't know. I think uh, emotions get high. I mean, these are, it, let's be honest. The buying a house is stressful. It is the most expensive thing that most of us buy in our lifetime. So uh, emotions get heated. And sometimes at the end, we, we can't be in the same room together. <laughs> Investment companies own about uh, one fourth of all single family homes. In what area? Are you saying like all throughout the United States? Or are you just saying in your specific area, Robert? I don't know if you know this, but 42% of Americans own, actually own their house outright. And of course, most of them are baby boomers. And then we have Gen X that owns the next amount. Anyways. Plasma Burn says uh, RNC and DNC are private corps, both owned by the same groups of people, pretty much. <laughs> You're not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> I thought banks and mortgages uh, lenders stopped selling uh, HELOCs. They go through waves. They'll pause them for a bit, and then, the, then they'll bring them back. During the pandemic, they get... And during the pandemic, they stopped HELOCs and then they brought them back. And then sometimes you like the bigger banks won't offer them like, you know, your Bank of America's and those that they, they won't offer them. But your local like credit unions, they'll offer them. Um, yeah. Just know that if you are closing, even though you've never used your HELOC on your house, if you're closing anytime. Uh, and just make sure you tell the title company that you have a HELOC, even though you haven't used it. Um that's important for your closing. I've had that happen too, where they're like, you have a second mortgage on the house. And I'm like, what? We don't have a second mortgage. Oh, the HELOC. We never did anything with it, but they had, you have to close that out too. It's part of the uh, closing process. Uh, the press release for the bill cited the Urban Institute study that claimed that in June of 2022, institutional investors owned roughly 575,000 homes, U.S. homes. Oh, what do they, I think there's way, way more than that. That is, oh, give me a break. There, that's, a, let me just put it this way. That's how many homes that are like Airbnbs in the United States. That doesn't, that is not true. That number is wildly incorrect. <laughs> you know, you could really get a study to say just about anything you needed to say to make the public. I mean, if you were to see that number and you, you know, you're, and you were just to take it for what it was, you'd be like, Oh, that's not that bad. What's all the fuss about institutional investors. They only, only, they only own 572,000 homes across the United States. I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. I mean, we don't, we all know they own a lot more than that. A lot more, but you can, you can get an article to say just about anything. You can get any statistic to say anything you need it to say. That's for sure. Oh, they, uh, Eddie's just saying that's just the hedge funds in March of 2023 investors accounted for 27% of all single home a family home purchases by June. That number om was almost unchanged at 26%. CoreLogic reports in 2020, 2021 saw a surge of investor activity. Investors have since held a market share uh, at, that averages 8% points higher than it did in 2020. And they haven't stopped. Even when interest rates were really high, investors have cash. So they're like, oh, this is an opportunity for me to go in while people are not going to buy. We can go in and start buying more homes. Um, I, I heard a real estate agent, Ray Ellen, saying that, you know, in Arkansas, the investors have still are still out there. 
there uh, in his area they had never stopped so yeah investors are going to invest uh reginald turner says a uh, question since home prices are dropping how long do, uh, after a, buying a home can you sell the same house to buy something bigger i always tell people and and this is this is a true statement no matter what if you don't plan on living in that house for more than seven years don't buy a house just don't if you have a company if you work for a company that will like pay for your closing costs and they're going to pay for your move and you know it doesn't matter and you can move in you know you move in three years that's different but you know for the average person living in a house uh, if you're not planning on living there for at least seven years, uh, it's, you're not going to make your money back. I've, it's very rare that you do. Um, I've seen it. Don't get me wrong. I've seen people get it, you know, have a house for a couple of years and still make some money off of it. But, um, if you're not planning on doing that, I, I always say seven years, seven years. That's the average. That is the average. Mm -hmm. Woo! Sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to balance this uh, computer on a pillow and it's not really working. <laughs> we did a, we're doing a makeshift live stream here today. <laughs> All right, JK says, um, in your opinion, where do you think real estate market is going next year? Okay, uh, I don't I don't like crystal ball predictions. Is it crystal music going? But there is one there's a couple of things that i definitely think are going to be um a major shift and one of them is going to be with real estate agents themselves the there's a ton of lawsuits out there now one of them just there was a lawsuit it it fined some of the biggest brokers in the united states accusing them of price fixing they're going to appeal this it's going to go through the appeals process but at this time right now I guarantee you every single MLS across the United States is meeting with a team of lawyers to re redo their, um, their uh, contracts and how they read and what is going to be disclosed and how agents, um, the monies are going to be uh, exchanged and how that those monies are uh, displayed to the public. It's always been public there. I mean, it says it right on the MLS, how the agents are paid, but um, I think that there's going to be more transparency, which is a good thing as the public is concerned. But uh, the other thing that's going to change with real estate agents is the fact that since the, this market is is a lot more difficult they're not selling as many houses it's not as hot and booming as it has been in years past because people are not not many people are selling their houses not many people are buying the houses we are in a place of of we're stalled you know as a real estate agent this is this is stalled for many realtors i can see a lot of more agents bailing out they're going to get out um, which is, it isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, so I, I, that is, that is one prediction that I can honestly tell you that is going to be the truth. Real estate agents and the way that we do transactions will change next year. There's no doubt in my mind, <laughs> absolutely no doubt in my mind. As far as interest rates are concerned, I do think that we're going to see, um, a drop in interest rates a little bit. Um, right now, like I said, we were like right around 7.2 the last time I looked. I can see it, uh, going into the sixes, uh, next year sometime, um, you know, as we head into the, you know, the presidential season that always uh, affects interest rates. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Um, if if interest rates go much lower, though, I'm afraid of with the lack of supply that we would have a buying frenzy on the, the least expensive homes once again. And that's not good for anybody. So it'll be interesting. I, I, I hate to give predictions. I don't I don't know 100 percent. The only thing I know for sure is that real estate agents, their world is going to be shaken up in 2024. <laughs> That's for sure. It's not going to look the same. Yep. Corporations are making seven year, 70 year high profits. That's not inflation. That's pure greed. <gasps> I don't know. If, like, I don't know if any of you follow me on TikTok, but if you follow me on TikTok, you saw this. I was floored right after Thanksgiving 
told this is total greedflation. Absolutely. There's so many products that all of these corporations are intentionally, first of all, they're shrinking stuff. They're shrinking the amount of like cake flour that's in some of these recipes. You used to be able to make 12 cupcakes. Now you can only make 10 it's because they've taken out so many ingredients in there and they've made the packaging smaller. But then on top of it all, they're like, you know, they purposely inflate the prices of stupid stuff like mayonnaise. I like after Thanksgiving, I love a jar of Miracle Whip. Don't laugh at me. Don't. I mean, it, it, this is not a conversation if you like Miracle Whip or not. I happen to love it on cold leftover turkey. We went to go get some. I am not joking you. You know, like the good size, you know, like a regular size of Miracle Whip. $13. $13. And Eddie only went in there just to grab that. So he came out to the car. He's like, um, I'm like, where's my change? And he's like, here it is. I'm like, how much was it? And my kid goes, $13. I said, put it, send it back. I do not need it that bad. And then he went in there and he took pictures of all the mayonnaise, just like regular Hellman's mayonnaise was $10. $10. And then all the other ones, $9. Even the cheapest one, like Duke's, was at like $8.99. So ridiculous. So ridiculous. And it's just greed. They, you, know, you know it's not costing them one cent more to make that jar of mayonnaise. And I know it's so crazy. We're talking about mayonnaise. But it's so many of these little things throughout our day that we have no choice. Have you looked at the cost of toilet paper recently? It's just absolutely sickening what they're charging. But they know we need it. And they know we're not going to live without it. So they're like, all right, we're just going to keep doing it. Because what? Do you, who's stopping them? Who's stopping them? And it's not like we can't use toilet paper. You know, like it's oh, <laughs> makes me so angry. Brandon Everett says, I think the next uh, bubble to burst will be a commercial. Oh, isn't that the truth? Yep, you're right, Brandon. Brick and mortar is doing horribly. That is that is, the, and that was one of the biggest things that they were saying why corporations were making employees go back to work because of their investments in corporate real estate. They saw their investments in corporate real estate tanking. So they're like, oh, we got to get all these employees back into the office so our, our investments go back up and then we can make more money. And I was like, well, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on that side of history, so I don't know if that's necessarily the case, but I mean, it made, it made sense in my brain. MH08 says, oh, wait, where'd it go? I don't know what MH08, uh, <laughs> you don't need to repeat, uh, toilet paper, get a bidet. We have one. We have one in every toilet. <laughs> Buy a bidet. Yep, we have, we have them. We do. But yeah, you still got a little, yeah, still got a little tappy tap. You got to get the water off the hiney. You know, you gotta, you gotta get a little, we have a bidet, but you still need a little, little bit of toilet paper. <laughs> freedom, uh, freedom off grid. Uh, what in, what you in for? A shop, I, I shop, <laughs> yeah, what are you in for? Shoplifted some Miracle Whip. <laughs> I shoplifted some Miracle Whip. It was $13. I had to, I had to put it on a cold turkey officer. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why I take the mayo packets from work. Uh, you know what? Don't, this is, this is true. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to tell you guys this, <laughs> but I'm honest. Whenever we go to Chick-fil-A, their Ch Chick-fil-A Buffalo wing sauce is absolutely delicious. So I always get four and then I stack them up. <laughs> and then when I get hungry for wings, <laughs> I take all those packets and squeeze them out <laughs> with wings. <laughs> I admitted that to 569 people. <laughs> you guys know my, my cheap secret. <laughs> I take Chick-fil-A packets to make buffalo wings at home. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> make your own Miracle Whip. Uh, yeah, it's easier and healthier. You know, wind hammer, that is true. We can do that. We can all do that. But like, then the cost of eggs are really high. The cost of oil is super expensive. So then you're trying to weigh it out. Is it more expensive to make it yourself? Or is it more expensive to, um, you know it's just, it's crazy. Like I won't go out to dinner. Like I will not go out to eat at all. It, the cost to go out to eat for mediocre food today, is just ridiculous. Service is terrible. They, even if you go get it to go, 
they already are, they already put a tip in there. They give you no choice. You have to pay them 20%. And you're like, Hey, I, I, and then you just feel like an idiot. Cause they're like, they turn around the little thing and it's already set up at 20, 25 or 30% for a takeout order. I'm like, Oh, come on. I'm like, um, I don't want to pay 20% for my takeout order. <laughs> like, so stupid. I mean, they're just filling in the stuff in the bag. Do they deserve 20% for a takeout order? My opinion, no. And, uh, I don't know. I just, I just rather make it at home, but it ends up being more, it's just as expensive, you know, a hundred dollars in groceries. You get nothing. You get nothing. Chris, you probably make a half a million a year. Oh, I wish. Oh, oh God, I wish <laughs> that would be so nice. My husband would be uh, a kept man. He would, he would be my house husband. <laughs> he would, he would love if I made a half a million a year. <laughs> Jim says it's Christmas. Have you uh, made your shopping list? I this year. I uh, oh oh wait, I read that wrong. Have you made your shop lifting list? <laughs> Jim, you're funny. No, I'm actually making I'm making my kids gifts this year. I know that sounds crazy, but I'm making them. All right, Popeyes is always load, uh, loads my big bag with hot sauce. I know, right? I mean, is it, with corporations, is it really, is it too much to add like three more sauces in the bag? So when I decide to eat hot wings later on in the week, I can use it. $4.99 Super Chat from Charles says, Super Chat. everything they can to keep the economy from crashing before the next election. Well, of course they are. You know, you don't, you don't generally win elections with a failing economy now, do you? doesn't really work out that way. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Yep. Plus blustery day says, question from the outside. It seems that the real estate brokers sit back on their laurels and collect their 1% of all home sales on both ends, buyer and seller, your insight. Um, it depends on your broker. Some brokers, some brokers suck. I mean, there's no doubt about it, but um, some of them are good. Some of them like pay for a lot of training for real estate agents. Um, just like anything, you know, some of them are terrible and some of them are, are you know, the, they don't earn their 1% and some of them earn probably more than that. Um, there's a lot of different brokerages out there uh, across the country. And now a real estate agent, they're, they're not locked in. There's nothing that says you have to work for the this specific real estate company in order to make it in real estate. So yeah, I don't know. Some of them suck. Some of them don't. It's not that. They're not that, that bad. <laughs> they're not that, that bad. I'm losing light. <laughs> Maybe I can turn this light on. Uh, let's see if this light works. Da -da. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know why they don't, why they changed the light. You know, like, why did they change? Why do we, I thought I could have sworn the daylight saving stuff. I thought that they, they voted against that stuff. I thought by now we wouldn't have like the daylight savings. I don't know. I don't know why we still have it. Miss Dizzy Lizzie says, uh, are we as citizens legally able to file a class, a class action lawsuit against the banks for using their greedy unpatriotic practices. You know what? I think you can pretty much sue anybody for anything. You just have to find the right attorneys to do it. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, Oh, I would, there's so many things that I would like to fix that I don't have deep enough pockets pockets to get it done. Um, I mean, corporations have a bigger pocket than, than I do. And you do. Um, even with us as real estate agents, there is a large company that was using our names. Like they would at the top of all advertising here on YouTube, they would say to look for Christina's Christina Smallhorn's listings, click here. And it would take you to their website. I was not getting paid by them, but they were using my name for people to go and look at listings on their website. And this was a huge company. And whenever it was brought to their attention, they were like, oh, well, we were just buying ads from Google. We didn't, we didn't know what was happening. They certainly did. They absolutely did. And um, they were like, we don't even sell leads to real estate agents. It, you know, I, that doesn't benefit us to, to use their name. Yes, it does. Cause it gets people to click on your, on your, 
on your uh, website. It absolutely does. Cause that way you can sell more advertising to, to other vendors on your website. So, um, but how could I, how could I, how could I stop them from doing it? You can't, They're, they got bigger pockets than we have. All right. PETA says, hello, PETA. A question, if, if the costs of ingredients are up, as you said, how is it the food producers costs of ingredients are not up? It's only greed. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's only greed. I'm not, I'm not, I'm talking, I'm not talking about your local farmers here. I'm talking about like your Tyson's, your crafts, your, uh, you know, um, those big guys that are like, <laughs> you know, like go, go, go look at a bag of chips now. I mean, it, what used to be 12 ounces is, or 14 ounces is now like eight ounces. And it's the same bag in the same packaging where they took the window out where we used to be able to see how many chips were in there. Well, now they took the window out and it's completely aluminum, you know, like a thin aluminum foil. And if you really want to make yourself gasp, look how much aluminum foil is today. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's like, you're not going to like make a car out of it. Aluminum foils really, really high. Christina, do you think the uh, office building getting converted into apartments and condos will make much of a difference? So I used to, I, I still think there is the, I think there is a place for this. The thing that um, becomes a problem for developers, because I've talked to some developers about this, is that whenever you're plumbing a building for corporate use, you have, you know, the, the plumbing is completely different. The wiring is different because, you know, you're putting in all these cable lines and phone lines and the type of, you know, there's no showers in there. They're toilets. It's, it's meant for corporate use. It's not meant for residential use. So the conversion part of taking some of these buildings is a lot more expensive than just going from scratch in some cases. Now, when you get into the more uh, dense areas like Los Angeles, Boston, New York, then it makes sense to take some of these buildings and convert them into to, uh, residential buildings. So I asked this guy, because um, I, I, I have this dream, I have this envisionment of what we have all these abandoned malls across the United States, tons of abandoned malls. We also have a problem that's happening is that more and more baby boomers are having a hard time finding assisted living areas for them to live. So my dream and my thought process is take these abandoned malls and the lower level of the abandoned mall would be for uh, medical purposes. Like, you know, any anything related to medical, you know, your uh, walk-in clinics, x-rays, that kind of thing would be downstairs. You would have a little food court just like you always did in the mall. And the upstairs would be apartments for senior living. That's my envisionment. I'm like, is, is that possible? That's what I asked him. He said that would actually be easier to do because most of the building itself would be used for what it was intended for, which is corporate use. Um, and since uh, you could make like apartments upstairs for uh, elderly residents, that would make sense. And it already has the elevators and escalators and all that stuff. And, and I don't remember if you remember when we were kids, all the old people loved to go around. We called them the mall walkers. This is years ago when I used to be a hairdresser. They, the mall walkers would be there first thing in the morning walking because they had, didn't have to worry about the weather. There's no elements to have to worry about the weather and they could walk around and everything. It would be great. And then anytime they needed to see medical care, they could be downstairs. Um, there, I, I, I can see that happening in some areas. I hope it does. But in a lot of times, it's just not um, cost effective to renovate those buildings from commercial use into residential use. But they may not have a choice there because if, if commercial real estate completely collapses, like uh, some have said that it might, um, they have no choice but to convert it to make money. And since we have a lack of supply of homes, they may just do that. We'll see what happens. It'll be interesting. It will be interesting. Smash the like button. That's what that's what Debbie Brady said. Smash that like button. Thank you, Debbie. All right, we got a question. Uh, can't they make commercial real estate single family homes instead of apartments? Less uh, cost to convert and you can get a long term residence. Okay, so yes, but you have to keep an eye on 
who's doing it and how they're doing it. Because I've seen some conversions that were just absolutely tragic where they took a strip mall and they made it into what they called uh, condos, right? There was, it was a one level condo. So it was a strip mall that they turned into condos. They left the same, like the same ceiling. They used the same corporate flooring. They even used some of the cabinetry that was in that office. That was their conversion. It looks, it looked terrible. There was no like extra walls in there. They're like, it's an open concept. I'm like, this is lazy. It was just, it was absolutely dreadful. Um, so as long as there's an eye on who's actually doing it. Um, and then a lot of times too, whenever they say, oh, we're going to have affordable housing coming in, then sure enough, it's not affordable at all. It's like luxury homes. So, um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm always leery. <laughs> I've been burned. We have all been burned in our years and around <laughs> every time that something sounds really good and a great idea. Then somebody comes in and finds another way to make more money off of it. And then it doesn't turn out to be such a great idea after all. All right. What's oh, wait, hold on, Eddie, go back. What, what happened? There was, there's a comment. I was going to read that. Oh, well, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll get back to it. If Eddie can find it. All right. Is it legal to buy uh, a plot of land and then park an RV on it to live as a permanent residence? This is going to be dependent on your area. Now, some areas that will allow for this, especially in rural areas, um, but in many areas they do not because it's not set up for septic and, uh, or well. You know, there's no septic or well. Even though it's an RV and you have your, you know, you're probably going to pump out the waste somewhere else. They want to know that there's a well on that piece of land before you ever park it. Um, the, in some areas, you are required to have uh, electricity, water, and sewage out there before you can park anything. doesn't matter if it's an RV, tiny home, no matter what. Um, but some areas don't care. So just you're going to have to find out because some uh, areas are considered campground um, areas, but they tell you you can't stay there for more than six months. You just have to check with that local area building and zoning and let them, they'll let you know if that's going to be uh, legal for that specific area. What's the price of uh, gas in your neck of the woods, Christina? Oh, I don't even know. <laughs> Two forty-five, two forty-five. Eddie said, "Not, not, not bad at all." But you know, we're in Louisiana. We usually uh, our gas is pretty cheap here. Can't they make a commercial uh, real estate uh, single-family homes instead of apartments? Less, yeah, Eddie. I, we already did that question. We did that. We did that. Now, hello, Christina. Happy holidays. <laughs> Happy holidays to you too, Nell. Nice to see you. How many of you, I mean, I've had a lot of new subscribers come in recently. How many of you are actually new to the channel? I have to tell you, you know, if you are new to the channel, just FYI, this is not my normal setup. We've had a little technical difficulties with my, my other setup. <laughs> That's usually my little office. I, my little computer needs a little overhaul over there. <laughs> we need more homeowners, not more renters. I concur. I 1000% agree with you. And uh, the, I don't think the powers that be want as many people owning a home as they do. Uh, as they, like, let me just put it this way. Jeff Bezos, the owner of the, the owner of CEO of Amazon, the, the guy, the godfather of Amazon, guess what he's doing? He's getting into real estate. And you too can invest just like Jeff Bezos for little money. So he's that's what he's doing. He's buying him and Amazon are buying up affordable housing to rent. And then you could be part of investment. And they're like, it's a whole trick, you know, bait and switch. We're going to buy up all these homes. And then you can just, you can own a little bit of it. You can own a little bit of real estate, you know, with stocks and stuff. We're get, we're doing you a favor. <laughs> it's crazy. And Jim said, uh, Heard rumors that home ins owners insurance was going to be spike nationwide in response to to tanking industry profits. Have you heard anything on that yet? Depending on what area you're in. So in Florida, they're in hot water. We're and here in Louisiana, we're kind of in hot water too. I'm not gonna. It's terrible. The amount that we pay in homeowners insurance is absolutely ridiculous. Um, we pay way more than the national average. So does Florida. Florida, I think is playing 42% more than the national average. Um, I think those areas have, 
uh, some reckoning to, to, I don't know how they can negotiate that out. I know that in years past, insurance companies try to raise uh, insurance rates really high in Florida. Um, when I lived there, that happened. But the governor at the time, I think it was, I think it was Jeb Bush, actually. He told them, I'm like, he's like, look, if you're going to pull out or you're going to cause cost, cost our homeowners here in our area that much more for insurance, then we're, you're going to have to take all of your insurance out of here. You're, you can't, you can't insure here anymore. And they were like, just kidding, just kidding. We're just going to keep the prices where they're at. And I'm like, he's like, yeah, that's what I thought. You know? So, um, anything is negotiable. Those insurance companies have made bank for eons off of our backs. And then now it's time to pay the piper because, you know, as uh, you know, obviously our weather patterns have changed over the last 30 years and they didn't tighten their belts where they should have, you know, it's just time for the insurance companies to pull up their bootstraps and start working for the American people. I mean, then that what they tell us whenever things go bad, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You'll be fine. You know, <laughs> maybe that's what they need to do too. And uh, not, th they shouldn't be allowed to pull out from people when they're in a, in a, especially if you've had them for like 30 years, they shouldn't be allowed to, to, to say, nope, we're canceling you. So uh, the lowest I've seen here in Southwest Virginia is a, uh, Two, $2.89. Oh, do you mean for gas? Yeah. Yeah. Dennis says, my realtor uh, encouraged me not to fill out a seller disclosure. It says, don't be too specific about flooding. If I did, it was off putting. Is that legal? No, it's not. <laughs> that is not, no, I'm not a lawyer um, by any means of the imagination, but I will tell you anything you withhold on a proper disclosure and the buyers know that you withheld that information and have proof that you've withheld that information, you're in hot crap. <laughs> you're in hot, hot water. No, you were, you were overly honest. Whenever I sold my house, I, I listed everything, everything that we ever did when we repainted the house, what the paint chips were, um, when we changed out the doorbell, uh, how many times that we had to change out the battery on the smoke alarms. We had it all logged in there. Whenever they got the house, they had a thing this big full of like all the stuff that we did to the house, everything. I mean, even, even the people that have mowed our lawns one time, anybody that had stepped foot on our house and had done any work, I kept the receipt and gave it to the new homeowners because I'm not going to be responsible. You know, like they have an inspection. This is all the stuff that we know about the house. This is everything that's ever been done to the house. And, you know, it's on you. Anything that happens to that house afterwards, and you do not disclose the information that you knew about your house that was pertinent to the sale of your home can get you in hot water. It really honestly doesn't matter what state you live in. If you don't give proper disclosure to the person buying your house, you're getting yourself, you're setting yourself up for disaster. Ah, you're right. It's, it feels a little off-putting. Like I would say, shady, <laughs> not just pop pudding, shady, <laughs> little shady, shady, shady. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Oh, it's $3 and one cents in North Florida. Yep. For newbies, the background isn't usual, <laughs> but Christina is the same. That is correct. <laughs> this is not the typical background. Look, I should, uh, I do a little like, oh yeah. We'll do a little, little campfires with Christina. Hello, everybody. We're going to be talking about real estate today with my friendly gnome. <laughs> I need to eat food. I'm getting off the going off the rails today. <laughs> As Stuart says, uh, needs a tinfoil. Yep. Is there any correlation between the invention of a REITs and the bat lack of inventory? They have been using the money for, or all for us to buy. So it's based on the bar market price. There is I will say there's a correlation to the REIT market and, and how corporate investors have been buying up mobile home parks, you know, like the places where people park their manufactured mobile homes in those parks and where they have to pay rent. When the, the REIT market became hot, investment companies loved mobile home parks because it makes them the most money. So I will say 
REITs are not great. They sounded great, but they're not really great for the economy. That's that's what causes more homes to become a commodity and then instead of a necessity, and, you know, like where they can bulldoze you over costs. Tanya Harvey says, when the seller discloses mold, can you ask for proof that it was repaired? What type of documents? Yes. So um, here in the state of Louisiana, I don't know where you are, but in the state of Louisiana, if you've done any kind of mold remediation, you have to prove that, that you did that. Um, here we have had numerous floods and it is very common for people to remediate their mold themselves. And you're probably thinking, no way, but it, trust me, we do it. <laughs> we do it, but because we've all done it so many times, it, there's, there's a process that you have to go through. You have to document everything and it, you have to show everything that you used, including the lot number of the mold uh, spray that you use. We know that you're not supposed to put bleach on the, the boards and all that stuff. We're very aware. So you have to prove all the documentation and then you have to prove it with, because they do it like a test, a moisture test to make sure before you even put the drywall up. So you have to pay for that specific test to have be done. Again, more proof that, that it was done, done properly. No moisture was there before the drywall went back up. You can ask for those specific tests that were done that, you know, first of all, that it was positive for mold and what steps were taken to have it remediated. And then I would also, if you're concerned about it, have a moisture test done on your expense because you're doing a inspection period, I assume, to make sure that there is no more mo moisture being held in those walls and that the mold isn't going to come back. <laughs> oh, the, the, the background makes my coffee cup look smaller. Well, it's the same size, I swear. See? Hello, everybody. If you like this coffee mug, I actually have an affiliate link in the description. It's from Amazon. I wasn't able to put my own personal branding on it, but it is the exact cup that Christina Smallhorn uses. <laughs> if someone signs a uh, as-is form, can the seller who does not disclose the information still be li legally liable? Ooh, this is a good question. So this is also dependent on your state and how their as-is sold uh, disclosure works, how it works in your specific state. But here in the state of Louisiana, as is at the time of closing means that's it. It's done. You cannot go back to the seller for anything with the exception of anything that was not disclosed to the buyer that was pertinent to the, the sale of that home. Meaning that like that guy asked about the floodwaters, if you knew it flooded, you didn't say anything and you know you didn't disclose that and the neighbors come down and say oh yeah this flooded all through here i have pictures and it shows them and it's the neighbors standing right there cleaning up all that stuff you could sue the garbage out of them but as is that's how it works in the state of louisiana as is no matter what now there is some as is no matter what <laughs> once you sign it belongs to you but there's uh, on top of disclosures on top of that as well so um, just check with your state on what as is means in your specific area. Who's on first says, uh, I'd like to suggest a program segment. Serenity Now Solutions to your first time home buyer pains. Profile one, location is actually affordable and prices haven't doubled in the last two years. Uh, oh, so like where you want to know like what state is affordable? what state is affordable and that where the home prices haven't doubled in a couple of years. I mean, I could do that. I can show you that. I'll look it up. I don't have a problem with that. No, the problem with that in a lot of cases, cause I, you know, this is what I do. I talk about affordable housing, uh, many places that you're looking at that are still affordable for people to move and, and buy. There isn't a lot of jobs, well-paying jobs where people would want to pack up and move. Um, to those locations. So anytime that you're looking for something affordable and you're still having to work at the same time, make sure that you're moving to an area that has potential for growth. Not meaning that like you hope something's going to happen. Like you read in the newspapers that certain industries are coming to that area or looking at the area. So that means it has that potential. Just, you know, be aware of that. Uh, just curious, what makes you, made you move to the Louisiana, Christina? 
Um, my husband worked for a sprint at the time and Hurricane Katrina had come through and they asked him if him and his young family would like to move to Louisiana to help rebuild uh, New Orleans. And he said, yep. And I said, yep. And that's how we ended up here. <laughs> we haven't left since. <laughs> I like it here. It's nice. And the weather's nice. And right now it's nice and cool. We even have the windows open. So... All right. I hope there's a, we have 552 of you. I hope there's 552 likes on this uh, live stream. That'd be awesome. Super chat. Oh, we got a super chat came in. Tanya Harvey says super chat. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, Tanya. Tanya, I appreciate you. Um, Cartman pig 92 says how enforceable are the tasks like leaving materials to the previous owner after closing, if it's in the contract. Um, like, are you talking about like, uh, there was like paint and all sorts of stuff like left around the house and they didn't clean it up. I mean, you can make a stink about it, but I wouldn't, I mean, in some cases, just, just I had one person that like would not pick up their garbage. They just wouldn't pick up their garbage. So there, my husband and I were picking up the seller's garbage because they wouldn't pick it up. And the home buyer was throwing an ever loving fit and rightfully so she just brought a brand new house and they had all this rotting food in the front of her house and nobody came and picked it up. So with that being said, <laughs> I mean, it just depends on how big of a stink you want to make about it. Most of the times whenever those things happen, your real estate agent's the one that ends up picking up the tab and, and cleaning it up because there isn't specific people to call for that. And if the sellers are out of town, they're like, I got my money. I'm done. You know? <laughs> oh, look, Sarah says we moved to Louisiana. Love it. And it's affordable. It is affordable. And, you know, like people are like, oh, you pay state taxes. Well, you should have stayed in Florida. Our cost of living here is miles difference. And uh, then and our housing costs are like the cost of living here is just so much less expensive than it ever was in Florida. I'm I would. <laughs> I'm not going back anytime soon. That's for sure. I'm not going. Oh, I want to say thank you to our moderators. I did not realize that we have been talking for a, a one hour and 21 minutes. My kids are coming over for dinner tonight. And next week, I promise you, I promise you with every fiber of my being that that setup in my office will be much better than it is today, than it was today. Thank you for everybody for being so incredibly patient with me uh, with this whole setup that I have. Uh, going on today. This is just my laptop. I'm, I know it's not necessarily the most professional thing, but we go, we go with what we have <laughs> when things go wrong. You don't give up. You just keep moving forward. And that's what we did today. And I appreciate everybody being so generous with uh, waiting for me to get that all straightened out. I appreciate every single one of you. And look at here. If you were looking for a, uh, to talk to me and you need a real estate professional referral, you can go to my website, just hit up one of those pink buttons, any of the pink buttons, make sure you put your, your, um, email address and your phone number. I can't call you if you don't leave your phone number. So please leave your phone number. I personally do call you. So you're not going to get some random person. I don't have a secretary. I'm not, the, I'm not that cool. <laughs> I'm not that, I'm not that fancy. <laughs> so. Uh, all right. And if you want to like, if you do want to go ahead and, um, uh, listen to this as a podcast, I have this downloaded to, um, anywhere you can find your uh, podcasts and just go ahead and, you know, take a listen. I'm there. If you, if they ask you what you think of the podcast, if you could give me five stars, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> if you head over there, you listen to the podcast. Super chat. Thank you. Alex, thank you so much for the $20 super chat. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Jim said something very true before we go. Jim said Baton Rouge and Nola are cancer alley. That is true. I did not know that until like, I think five years ago, I was very unaware until I saw a documentary talking about cancer alley. And I'm like, Ugh, I live right there. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. She said, thank you to me. I want to say thank you to you. I want to say thank you to everybody for coming out here. Over 500 of you today coming and spending your time with me, even though I was a hot mess. I appreciate every single one of you. I want to say thank you to the moderators for keeping the chat clean. And I want to say thank you to all our new and old uh, members coming in today. I appreciate every single one of you. Next week, I don't know what we're going to talk about, but we'll figure it out. We're always going on the real estate market, always living in unprecedented times. <laughs> I'm kind of done with it, but we'll give, maybe we'll do some, we'll, we'll do some predictions. We'll see what people are saying. We're, we're going to do a little predicting. We're going to ask your predictions. Okay.
All right, everybody. Be good. Yo, I gotta, I gotta get that. Why are you doing that? Sure.